All right. Yeah. So so this is about me. And and so yeah, we we will just get a quick overview of ferrite and and a, a little a little bit about how ferrite is designed and and the, the way and also a little bit introduction of rust before we will go go into a interactive exercise uh, using Visual Studio Code, which I have a session here and we have the students uh, joining to the session. And later we will we will have a live session here that is uh, we are going to go through the exercise and have people um, in turns uh, writing filling in the blanks for these exercises. And before we start, so we will just get a quick introduction for ferrite, and and so so the basic. Um, overview is that uh, ferrite we implement the linear and shared session types that have, we have described um, in Stephanie's lectures um, in particular the, the intuitionistic linear and shared session types and the library itself it, it pro allows compile time safety of um, linear usage of session um, linear, linear, linear usage of the channels so that if you which means that contraction is not allowed. Um, you are not allowed to drop the channels and you are also not allowed to duplicate it. So this, uh, the library itself is published on GitHub and is open source and you can use it with the ferrite session crate, which is published. And right now the version of ferrite is uh, version 0 0.2.0 as at the time of this uh, lecture, this tutorial. And so the, the design of the library is still changing quite a lot. So in case you are looking at the recording or you come back to the library sometimes later, the, the, the interface might change, the syntax might change a little bit. So we have a technical report, which is you know, in this link. And, and so if you are interested, you can also read more on there. And so um, I've asked in the Slack on if anyone needs a quick introduction to Rust, and a few students uh, indicate that they, they would like uh, to have a quick recap. So I will just spend a little bit of time to highlight um, what uh, Rust, the language features of Rust. And hopefully, if you have already have um, other experience in other languages like Haskell or ML or Camels, then um, hopefully this will be um, familiar to you. So, um, and a little bit about why we want to use, uh, why we might want to choose Rust and instead of um, Haskell or OCaml or other languages um, for, why, why do we want to use Rust for, to implement session types? And one reason for this um, is that Rust it actually have pretty good support uh, for functional programming and also type level programming as, um, we actually use quite a lot of um, type level programming techniques in Ferrite. At the same time, Rust is also um, pretty good at um, supporting high performance uh, system programming that allows us to actually write uh, very high performance applications. And in particular, Rust also have these uh, special affine type systems, which um, as compared to linear types, Rust, uh, the affine types in Rust allows you to drop a variable so you can define uh, available and you can choose to not use it. And Rust also have the support for message passing concurrency in the form of Rust channels. Um, and, and this is actually um, a bit similar to the way to communicate through the normal um, um, the channels in PyCoupless. So you have a single type and you have a single direction channels. And this uh, also similar to the channels in uh, languages like Go, for example. And lastly, the Rust, um, the, at least the new versions of Rust, they are now having a good support for single weight interfaces. And this is also allows us to have a good support for concurrent programming. And we will just go through uh, a quick tour of um, the language features available in Rust. So the first thing we have as uh, we, for functional programmers is that Rust support high order functions. 
So which means we can have closures with uh, functions that are capture variables and you can um, pass them as uh, values to other functions. And the way higher order function in Rust is defined is uh, using trace, which we we'll also describe uh, later. And, and the way this, you, the way you read this is that um, this input is like an existential type. So um, um, this, this map coordination function is to say that you have a point and you have a self. This is also the, um, similar to the object-oriented programming. And you can have a function that um, implement this uh, fn, which is a function that can be called multiple times. And it has a signature that it takes a i6 integer 64 and returns a integer 64. And the syntax for creating the closure is to have this double bar. So you have a map chord, and then you have a, this base like lambda. So it's like for other language, you can think of this as um, slash. So you have a lambda x, and then you have x plus one. And um, Ras also have these uh, features that is borrowed from Lisp which is macros, which is also very useful because um, we can add additional syntax to Rust to, um, to describe um, to if, if, we, if we, we can actually expand the syntax of Rust to add additional rules to it. So for example, if we don't like, for example, let's say we don't like this uh, double bar syntax, we can, we can have a macro rules that use uh, these fat arrows to replace this uh, double, double bar, vertical bar. And of course, um, Ferret also use a bit of uh, the macros to to the sugar to, to to act as a syntactic sugar for some of the constructs. And so um, you see how the fn type is uh, different from um, linear types. So the first thing fn types are uh, in Rust that is um, that makes Rust uh, special is that if you define a normal variable, like from over here, we have a point variable that, um, and if we try to use this uh, point twice, so you can see you have a function that takes a point value. And when you, when you call this function, the, the function actually takes in the value and it type, you kind of move the ownership of the object uh, of this uh, value to the function you have passed to. So in this case, um, since we, we have already used the point, we have already passed this uh, point object to this use point function. And if we call it a second time, you will say that um, you cannot do it because um, this object, this, the ownership of this basically, it, it, basically the ownership of this has already been transferred. And although, although this is the case for the like normal values, Rust also have this uh, thing that is um, borrowed from C and C++, which is reference type, and which is kind of um, act like similar to the reference references in uh, C and C++, that you can get a reference to an object. So for example, here we have a point object as well, a point value, and we can pass this value as a reference. So we can pass the address of this value to this function, so this is kind of called uh, this is called borrowing in Rust. So you can borrow and borrow an object to a function, and so this function will be given a borrowed value of point, and it can do something with this point. And after after this function returns, it will also return the ownership to the caller. So with that, we can actually use that use it a second time to call to to use the same object, the same value to to call it inside another function. So lastly, Rust also have um, this clone semantics, which um, is used for, um, used, for, used for recovering the semantics for copyable objects. So, so, so if, um, if you have an object that has a, if you have a struct that has a, all the fields they are clonable. You can use this derived clone macro to implement the clone trait, which allows you to basically make copies of the object. It is also possible for you to um, de de um, implement the clone trait um, manually for more complicated structures. 
And what this allows you to do is that you, you can basically make a copy, explicitly make a copy of this object. So when we're here, we have a point and we have this function that original function that also takes our, takes ownership of an object. So we, we transfer the ownership to, to this function. We just ignore, know that we just ignore why it's, uh, why it's inside the function. So in this example, it's actually an empty, empty body, but it doesn't really matter because like, um, we, we don't care what's inside the function. The point is that we can clone the object and we can use it multiple times. And of course, this, uh, this may incur additional costs because like if this object is a complicated object that uh, use some memory and it may take some operation to actually copy the content of the object to another memory location before calling the function. And Rust also have this uh, copy semantics, which is uh, diff a bit diff slightly different from cl for clone. Because when you use clone, you can you actually need to um, pass this, um, you, you actually, actually need to explicitly call this clone method on the, on the object. So this is also an object-oriented style of uh, calling the values. So you actually have to explicitly clone the value before to, to actually have a copy of it. On the other hand, for, for the copy semantics, is uh, the difference is that the Rust compiler will actually automatically do the copying for you. So in this case, we say that we want to derive a copy tree for our point struct. And once we have this uh, implement this, we can also seamlessly use this kind of multiple times. So you can see like we can actually call this with the use point function that is taking the ownership of the value. And behind the scenes, Rust is a, the Rust compiler is also automatically doing the copying so that it's also doing the copy behind the scene. And for copy trade, you actually um, cannot implement it manually. So, so for more complex object, usually you will have to use the clone trade. And it also allows you to be aware that you are actually might be doing some memory, um, memory intensive operation that by copying the values. So we also have generics. So for, for the generics, um, the syntax is in this angle bracket. So we have a point struct that is parameterized by a type T, for example. And we also can have functions that is uh, parametric to types, which is also indicated in this angle bracket. And for, the, for each type parameter, we can also have, a, have additional constraint, which is traits that uh, impose additional uh, requirements on what um, trait the type has to implement. And for those coming from Haskell, um, Rust also have traits, which is um, similar to the type classes in Haskell. And the way traits works is um, by you, you have this uh, trait. And the traits, um, they, they are always parameterized by a self-type that is um, kind of implicit as similar to the first type variable in the type classes in Haskell. So we are saying that a type implement a distance, the distance trait. And implicitly we have this self variable that is used to reference the type that implement this trait. So for example, we can have a distance trait for point 2D and then we have a distance trait for point 3D. And inside these traits, we also have associated types. So, so in, inside these traits, if we implement, we can say that a, a trait distance have an associated type unit, and we can use these uh, associated type inside other methods in the traits, for example. So at this point, uh, is there any questions on, uh, on Rust? Nothing no, so far, it's been quiet, unless my okay. chat is broken. I don't think it is. Okay. So then yeah, I'll just keep, keep going. Okay. Yeah, so, so, for, so for Rust, the, the main thing we want to compare for why using ferrite is that um, right now, the usual way of doing concurrency in Rust is uh, using this uh, so-called message, message passing concurrency. And the way you usually do message, message passing concurrency in Rust is to use these uh, Rust channels. 
which is um, a more restricted version of uh, channels that we have in session types. So the way channels in Rust work, so this, this is not the ferret channels, but rather the, the usual Rust channels, is that we have a channel that has a, consists of a sender endpoint and a receiver endpoint. And these this, uh, sender and receiver, they are parameterized by a specific type. So for example, we have, can have a channel with the payload type as string, then we can have a function that takes a sender and we will send something to it. And if you have a receipt, we, we can have a function that takes a receiver and it, will, it can, it can uh, receive value out of this, uh, this channel. And some of the channel implementation, they allows you to have send and receive multiple values. Or we can have a one shot channels that allows us to send and receive at most one value. So the example here, we actually have a ad hoc implementation of a message passing concurrency in Rust. And the way we do this is that we first spawn a sender receiver pair using this channel object. And we manually call this spawn function, which is provided by this uh, Tokyo library, which is one of the async library in Rust, to spawn a new task that run this uh, provider function inside this task. And similarly, we spawn an up, we spawn another task, which is similar to a uh, process or threads. So task is like a lightweight uh, async, async um, it's like a lightweight async threads that, um, that do not map, do, do not have a one-to-one -one correspondence to the OS thread. So that allows you, that allows us to spawn Many many async tasks in Rust without having to um, incur the cost for spawning a lot of threads. So this is the usual way of writing uh, message passing concurrency in Rust. And um, now that you have learned a bit about session types, you might notice that uh, that there might be some issues of writing it in this way. And one of the issues for this uh, is that since Rust has an affine type. That means that if you have this sender and receiver variable, that is uh, like uh, act as a, just a regular Rust value, that means it is actually possible for you to ignore the ignore this value and do not send anything or do not use the receiver at all. And so for example, here we have a originally we have the client which is supposed to send a string value. And here we can, it is possible that we can forget to implement this function for whatever reason, and we just drop the sender. And in this case, if the, if the, the other side tries to receive it, receive the value, Rust will actually tries to, Rust will actually raise panics, and this will cause the application to crash. So, so that kind of introduced um, the overview of why we might uh, want to, session type based on concurrency in Rust. And the other reason is that we can also use session type to have a more precise protocol specification, especially if we have a more complex protocols that we want to specify about. So for example, if we have an internal choice and we want to send and receive value at the same time, then session type actually helps greatly for us to um, precisely specify this uh, in, in, in as a in, in our session type. So um, any question at this point? So far, chat is quiet. Uh, okay. okay, we got one, sorry. Yeah, Prasanth yeah. asks, um, he didn't understand what the specific problem was with having affine types. So yeah, this, sli this slide right okay. here. Okay, yeah. So what we have here is that we have the Provided, so we have two processors. In the original example, we have two processors that um, have these uh, channel values. And there is an implicit contract here between this provider and the client function, that, which is that the client is supposed to send a value to the provider through this uh, sender, right? So you kind of have an implicit contract that uh, is expected for the application to work. But in actual, we might implement, so we might, especially if the application is complicated, we might have implement a function 
that do not actually use this value because um, the affine type system allows us to just uh, ignore, not use the value. And so in this case, you can see this client is actually an empty function. So it just drops this sender. But if you just, uh, if you are linking the two process together, then when you call this function, it will actually try to receive the string value out of it. But since nobody is sending the string value, then that means that this, uh, this call will actually crash. So in Rust, this uh, will result in a panic because we are calling this unwrap. So there are ways to re uh, handle the errors, but for example, in this case, we are just using the unwrap, which will result in a panic and this will cause the application to crash. So does that explain? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. So now we will see like how the how ferrite um, maps the session types we have uh, learned in Stephanie's lecture into into the types in Rust. So the way we name these uh, session types is by uh, naming them from the perspective of the providers. And we start with the shared session types. So for the shared session types, we have this uh, L up arrow S which we, we just name it to linear to shared and is parameterized by a linear session type A. So we just linear to shared A. So this is the shared layer. And for the linear layer, we have this uh, down arrow SL, which is named to shared to linear. And this is parameterized by the, the shared session type S. So here we, we also use the type variable A. Um, and then for the termination, so in the lecture, we use the one for termination. And here in the syntax for ferrite or in the formal syntax for ferrite, we use the epsilon, which is used for the unit and termination. And in fact, in Rust, we name this uh, N. And ferrite also introduced two new constructs that are not found in the original session type which is specifically for sending and receiving values for Rust. So first we have this uh, right triangle. So we have a type tau, tau right triangle A. So this A is a session type and this tau is a Rust type. And it's used to indicate that the provider is going to receive a value from the client. And this value will be of type T. And after receiving this value, the provider will continue as the session type A. And similarly, we also have this tau and then left triangle A, and this is used for the provider, the provider to send a value of type T and then continue as A. So we also have these are uh, the tensor and lorry that we have uh, learned before. And in ferrite, we actually named this uh, receive and send channel because um, the way we do it is that we treat normal Rust values as uh, the affine values. And we treat the linear values. So we treat the linear resources as channels. So, so then here we are, we are receiving a linear channel of type uh, session type A, and then we continue at session type B. And this session type EIG, um, it enforced such that you must linearly use this uh, channel A. So finally, we also have these uh, binary choice constructs, which is um, which allows us to define multiple branches of uh, external and internal choices. So the simplified version is that you have uh, just a A plus B. So there is a binary choice, and here we have uh, we can have many branch, many labels of our uh, choices. And this is actually translated to the Rust type internal choice. And we have this special construct H list that we will describe later that um, is uh, used to define a type level list. So this, uh, this session types A, the num you can have, for example, you have three, three branches. Then here you have a type level list consists of three elements A. So I see there's some question in the chat. 
So we are trying to. Yes, Joe, if you'd like to uh, unmute and ask that, feel free. Yeah. So, um, uh, like the uh, here in this kind of on this page, like the towel, those rust ones, are we treating those as like of a different sort to the a and b or, or a different right. kind right okay that's right that's right so we have the shared layer which is s and we have the linear layer a b and additionally we actually have a, a rust layer which is in tau and also the rust uh, context so this is just regular rust value that you want to send around for example integer right or strings so you can if you if you're just sending an integer value or a string value or like from the point value in the previous example, then these are sending as a, just regular values instead of the linear resources. Yeah, it's just because in Stephanie's lectures at first, we, we were just sending channels around. That's right. But obviously we still want to be able to use regular Rust values. Right? That's right. So, okay. so that's why we have these two new constructs specifically for handling Rust values. Okay. So yeah, now that we learn about the basics, we'll just look at a quick hello world example for that can be written in ferrite. So on the left here, we have a hello provider that's written in a pseudocode. So we have a pseudocode to say that hello world, this hello world is a, has a session type, string, right triangle, epsilon. And recall that here we have the right triangle is used for receiving values. So it means that this provider is receiving a string value and then it terminates, right? And the way we write it is that we first use receive value to bind it to the name and then we print it and then we just terminate. And when we write this in um, Rust itself, the way we write it is as follows. So we we use this uh, session construct. So we have a special uh, type here, session, that's used for representing a uh, session type program. And inside this session is, is describing the session type that's being offered by this provider. So we are saying that this provider is pro offering this session type of receive value and then string and then continue as n. And to implement this function, we actually use a continuation passing style, which is that we first say that we want to receive a value from the channel, from the offer channel. And then the receive value is actually bind using this closure. So we pass this uh, closure to the receive value to act as the continuation. And inside this closure, we just bind this uh, the receive value to this variable name. So this name will have the type string. Yes, we are receiving a string value. And in the hello world case, we just print it out and then we just terminate. So any questions here? So what does it provide here? So we have this uh, hello world and we have this session types that's specifying what this provider, what this provider is offered to do. And what happens is that if we actually um, violate the protocols that we have specified, for example, we just say that we do not want to do anything with the value, for example, then let's say we try to just terminate directly, right? And if we terminate directly, we actually get a type error when we try to build our Rust programs. So this actually results in a compile time error. And the exact error message is not too important now because we'll explain later. But the key is that there's some errors here. And similarly, we can also uh, look at the, how the clients are defined in, in Ferrite. So we first look at the left side. We have this hello client and it wants to interact with this uh, provider the provider that's offering this uh, session type string right triangle epsilon. And the way we interact with the provider is by receiving it as a channel. So we are receiving the channel offered by the provider using this lolly. 
And then we just say that after we interacting with the provider, we just terminate. So what we do is that we use this receive channel and we bind this to A. So this A is a channel variable, which means we, we must use this linearly. And we just say that we want to send a value to A because since the provider is expecting to receive a value. So in this case, we want to send a value to this channel A and we see, send this string value. And then we wait for A, this channel A to terminate before we terminate it ourselves. So I see there's some questions. You got one question from, from Piotr who is asking, uh, yeah. why doesn't it look more like Haskell basically? <laughs> he's, he's asking if there's any, any support for like a macro system or a uh, DSL to make it uh, a little more monadic, I guess. Oh well, yeah, unfortunately not, not for now. So it, it may be possible to do it with macros. But um, using macros has its own limitations. So we try to not use too much macros or introduce too much magic. So, so yeah, um, right now is uh, we have to do this in a continuation passing style. But actually, as you will see later, this actually um, can also allow us to more easily reason about uh, our program as compared to the monadic approach. So we will just uh, look at the Rust code on the right side, right? So we have we translate the way we translate is that we translate this lolly first. So we say that this client, the hello client, is offering a so the client is also offering a a channel, right? So the client is also offering something, and what the client offers is that he offers to receive a channel, and the chan session type of this channel is received by the string n. And after receiving this channel, the client will interact with this and then it will terminate. And the way we write this is also in the continuation passing style. So we say that we receive this channel and we name this channel A. We send the, this string value at least to A and then we wait for A to, to terminate before we terminate ourselves. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. So no questions. Yeah. So by the way, there's uh, also one other thing that's uh, different from the session type, the, the syntax we have in the lectures is that the provider channel, they, it does not have a name. So for example, here we can see that, um, not here, the hello provider. You can see that the provider um, is, uh, it says it want to receive a value, but we do not have to specify which channel we want to receive it from because there's always only one offered channel. So every, every session type program in Ferrite, there's always only one offered channel. So we do not have to say that which channel we want to receive from. On the other hand, for the client, when we receive a new channel, we are acting as a client of this channel. So we always have the channel of the client side name. So when we say that we receive a channel of type and we bind this channel to A, then after that, when we want to send a value to it, we have to name, we have to tell it that we want to send specifically to this channel A, because there may be more than one uh, channel that is available in the linear context. And similar for the, for the case for hello provider, right? You, you have this channel variable and this channel variable, you might think that, okay, it's a, it's a Rust type, it's a Rust value, so maybe I can drop it, right? But actually no. So if you remember, if you write this channel A and then you just drop A and you just say terminate, you also get a type error. And this, in this case, um, the type error is basically saying that you have a non-empty linear context and you cannot actually terminate. Okay, I see there's some comments. If there's no questions, I'll continue. You're good so far. Alex is observing uh, kind of as a side note that your uh, definition for a queue and the De Bruyne indexing approach that you used was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, we, we, will go, we, we will go through that later. Okay, yeah, actually now, right now, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at how this, uh, this mechanism is actually implemented. So I think we have like 15 minutes. So the way we implement this is that we call that we have this typing judgment. So we have a 
linear context delta. And for the case of uh, ferrite, we actually also have a rust context, which we use uh, gamma to indicate here. So we have a rust context gamma, which we which ferrite do not have control. So this is actually handled by rust. But we also have a linear context delta, right? And together with gamma and delta, we want to say that um, a certain expression offers the session type A. And the way we translate this to ferrite is to say that a certain expression will have this rust type partial session angle bracket C comma A. And, the, and this, these two type parameters, C and A, is that the C correspond to the linear context gamma, right? So this is the structural context. So this linear context gamma is correspond to C and the A is the offered session type. So when we say that we have a value of this type partial session CA, we are actually get, saying that um, this, this expression represents a ferrite program that is promise that there's a promise go, is going to linearly, linearly use the channels in the linear context C and it will offer the session type A. And the way we define these uh, types is by using traits that we have described earlier. So we have a protocol trait and this protocol trait is used to represent session types. So we, we call session types in ferrite protocols and we have this context to represent the linear context. So a partial session is parameterized by two type variables. And as long as these two type variables implements this context trait and the protocol trait, then it is a valid ferrite program. And for the special case that we have seen earlier, this session, this type session, is actually a type alias to this partial session, thus unit and A. And this unit is is used for us to represent an empty linear context. So we use this unit to represent empty linear context. And for any other context, so if you have a non-empty context, we actually use this hitch list macro with any number of elements in it. And when we use hitch list macro, behind the scene is actually desugaring de this to a type level list, which is uh, nested tuples in Rust. So we start with the, these are uh, empty. So we use the unit for the empty list. And then we use this tuple, this comma tuple for cons. So you just start with the empty list and then we just append everything up to the head. So this is the type level list in Rust. And, and this C is a linear context. If you have a type level list that all its element is implement this protocol trait. And, and so now we, we know how this, uh, this construct works. You see that the way we next, we, the way we translate these, uh, we actually implement the typing rules is by what we call a judgmental embedding technique. And the way the judgmental embedding technique works is that for every typing rule we have, so for example, here is a typing rule for receiving a value in ferrite. So this is the formal typing rule. And below we translate it into a function. And for this function, we have this function with uh, the premise is translated to these are uh, the arguments. And the conclusion of this typing rule is translated to, into what is written by this function. So for each typing rule, we actually write a, define a Rust function that make it such that all the premise become the argument and the conclusion become the return value. So for the case here, we have this um, we have this gamma, which is handled by a Rust. And you can see that um, we have a A, right? And and we use this function, we have this input fn once, is to use to bind new variables into the Rust context for, for this case. And, and, and this is the actual continuation. 
which is correspond to the C and the A. So this is a continuation passing star. And what happens when we write this program, parallel program, we can think of it as actually writing a proof tree. So in every step, we are actually um, constructing this, uh, we are actually kind of constructing a proof tree corresponding to the typing rules that we have defined. So we start from the, the, the final line, terminate, right? And we can go from the bottom up or like the, our, the innermost expression and we go all the way up and we are kind of like just uh, constructing these typing rules that we define in, in Rust itself. So in a way you can kind of think of this as we are extending, extending the typing rules in Rust by adding our own typing rules. So we have these uh, structures so we have these, uh, these protocols, which are defined in, in Rust as structs. And we also have this, uh, we just implement this protocol for every one of them using um, this uh, input, input definition for implementing protocols. And for linear context, it's also the same. We have these uh, trait context. And then, um, so I, so, in brief, is that we have this. Uh, we start say to say that the unit is a context, and if the tail is a context, then the any any context with a new element a appended to the, the beginning, and if a implement the protocol, then it is also a context. So the way we when we define the linear context as this way. There's actually a complication on how we handle this, uh, the name channel in the linear context. Because if you recall, when we define the type level list, so we, when we define the linear context in ferrite, it actually does not um, have any name in it. So all the elements, they are positioned by, they are identified by position. So you don't actually have a name in it. So how do we actually, how do we actually handle like, which channel we want to access in the linear context. So we, we need some ways to access the elements. And we also need some ways to add and remove channels from the linear context. So you got a fun one from uh, Chuta who asks if you can prove deadlock freedom. Um, not actually. Uh, in fact, ferrite, um, if, you, if you combine ferrite with arbitrary Rust expression, it's not possible to be deadlock free. So, if you, if you just use the linear fraction of uh, ferrite and you do not use any additional Rust expression, then yes, it should be deadlock free. But of course it will be tricky to prove. And, but if you add, for example, if you add the shared session type, uh, if, you, if you already not uh, have this, uh, it already cannot provide deadlock freedom. And we actually have an exercise in the dining philosopher to demonstrate that you can actually cause deadlocks once you have set shared session types. And once you add arbitrary Rust expression, it is also not possible because like the Rust expression itself, it can also uh, do its own concurrency. So like from a Rust expression, inside a ferret program, the, the ferret program may want to access a Rust mutex, for example. So we cannot prevent that. And so the point is not exactly to prevent that log freedom, but rather is to for, for the Rust programmers to um, more precisely specify the protocols and make sure that uh, the linearity is enforced. Yeah. So now next we will see how we actually handle the handle the naming accessing elements in the linear context. So the way we do it is by using this context lens trait. So we have a context lens trait, which says that um, a type implement this context lens for a certain channel, for the certain linear context C. And it allow allows us to um, replace a particular element A1 in, in C to A2. And once we replace A1 with A2, then this target, this associated type target, is the resulting linear context. 
And the way we implement this context lens is by using type level, type level natural numbers. So here we have an example. We have a context C1, which is in this form, H list, and then we have a number of elements. So for the particular channel at the end position, if we want to update it to B, then we will get C2, right? So the, all the other elements in this uh, C1 is, remains unchanged, except this uh, A at position A, N. And for any, any linear context in this form, right, the natural number N, it implements this context lens. So it, it allows us to manipulate the specific element at position N in this uh, type level list. And we can update it to any element B. So is there any other questions? No. No, nope, just discussion. Okay. Yeah. So with this, with this uh, linear con this context lens, we can actually define the right rules for receive value as this, right? So we have this uh, bottom here. At the bottom here, we have this uh, rule for the send value. So the way we send value is that if we have something in, so if we have a variable X in the Rust context, which has type T, and if we have a channel that has the type T right triangle A, then we can send the value X to A. And then if we continue as K, then the gamma, the A, the channel A in gamma, no, the channel A in Delta will be updated to just um, session type A and the X will consume, right? Because it's a fine. So the way we define it uh, in, in Rust is that we parameterize by this uh, N. So we parameterize by this context lens N. And we just say that if N implement this context lens, which updates C1 from this uh, receive value TB to B, then the continuation will have this uh, new context C2. And the original, and the and the continue the conclusion. So the conclusion will have this uh, linear context C one. So now that we know about linear context, we can see that when we write up the hello client, right? When we write this uh, example program, hello client, what actually happens is that when we say receive channel, this uh, variable a is actually just a single turn value of type Z. So this is actually just a context lens. And when we say, pass this A to this send value two, it is saying that this, uh, this A have type Z and this Z implements this particular context lens that is needed by send value two to modify the, the linear context that we have. And similarly, so, so in this case, the C is this, right? So the C is, has this uh, one element. So C is the linear context with just one element, which is receive value string N. And Z first uh, update this uh, from receive value string N to N. And the result is that when, when we have this expression weight A terminate, then the, the C that is uh, seen by weight is actually H, uh, the type level list that is consists of N. So you can see that's how the linear context is actually progressing as we pass on in the continuation. So yeah, that's about the, the basic introduction to ferrite. And now we'll just go through um, each of the construct. And as we go through, we will also go through the exercise and try to um, make use of what we have learned. And hopefully the concepts can also help you to know how to debug your program in case you encounter the problem. So the first rule we have is termination. So, so we recall that we have a left and right rule. So for the termination, we have a provider site and the provider site is just this terminate expression that we have seen. And the terminate, it actually allows us to parameterize over any empty linear context. And this actually, I, I haven't covered this. So basically, um, when you remove a channel in the linear context, 
it does not actually remove the elements in, in the linear context. Instead, it's actually replaced it with empty. The reason for this is that we want to preserve the position because like if you remove it, because the, the context lens, they, the types don't change. And so if you re actually remove the elements from the linear context, then it will break the other context lenses. So what we do is actually we replace this with a special type empty. And if all the elements in this list is empty, then this is also an empty linear context. And so the example here we have is that we have a terminate and we, we can just write session n that offers and the type is terminate. And this is uh, the trivial program we can, the most simple program we can have in ferret. So next we have the weight rule, the, the client rule. So we have the termination also, but right now we have the left rule. So we have a, so for the left rule, we have a channel A in the linear context, which is of type epsilon. And if we wait for it, it will, it will just remove the, it will just remove the channel A from the linear context delta in the formal settings. But in the, in ferrite, so in the rust settings, what we have is that we have the weight, we also have the linear context N. And what happened for this N is that it allows us to change a linear context C1 in the form of this type level list. And for the N position, so I use this pseudo code to say that this is a type level list with the N element is N. And if N allows us to change this position from N to empty, then this weight is a valid expression. So the example here we have is the receive channel. So we receive a channel of type N, and then we also just want to terminate ourselves. And the way we can write it is that we just receive this channel C, and then we just wait for C to terminate, and we just terminate ourselves. So there's also one uh, macro for us to just a uh, shorthand for us to wait for multiple channels to terminate. So for example, if we have many channels in the linear context and all of them have only have the session type epsilon, we can just say wait all and we have the, all these channels. And what this macro does is that it expand this to wait C1 and wait C2 and so on. So this allows us to just uh, slightly shorten our fair programs to make them uh, make the program shorter. Doing fine for questions, but a quick heads up that you've got about half an hour left. Yeah. All right. So I'll just try to introduce a few more rules and then we can go to the exercise. So there's the forward. So we also have the forward. So if we have the, if we have a certain elements in the linear context with type A and all the other elements empty, then we can just forward the elements Right, it's for the channel. So um, a few things, a few more things we will want to introduce before we can do the exercise. So we also have this include session. This is also one a rule that is uh, slightly different from the formal typing rules in SEAL. So this include session is actually similar to um, the cut. So if you look at the, the shape is similar to cut. The main difference is that on the left here, you can see that this is actually an empty context. So we are including something, we, we are including a program with an empty context and we add, introduce it to, to our, so, so we, we basically spawn this other program of, that offers A and then we include this channel A inside our linear context. So, so this, uh, this a, A prime is, is appended to the end of the linear context. And so the example here we have is that we have a P1, which is a program that just terminates. And we have a P2 that we can just include this program P1. And then we have this channel C, and then we just wait for C to terminate before we terminate. So we can see that this is, uh, we, we are just, uh, adding, so we are just spawning P1, and then we just uh, use it, interacts with it using this uh, channel C inside our linear context. 
And we also have this apply channel, which is used to link the client and provide the process. So if we have this uh, client F, um, which is uh, A lolly B, right? And if we, we have a provider that offers A, then we just apply F to A. And we, what we get there is a, a new program of uh, session type B. So this is similar to functional application. And we, we just use this to apply to two programs so that we can get back a program that is a, a new, new program that will spawn the two, both the provider and the client. So we have this step. So this is for us to wrap an async program, async, uh, so some async expression. And so for example, here we have the step and then inside here, this is actually a async block. So we have the async block that allows us to have some uh, async expression in Rust. So in this case, we have a program that just sleep for one second before it terminates. And we can use this to wrap our programs if we want to do additional things in our continuation. So once we all define our fair program, we can use this run session to actually run it. Um, so one thing to note is that when we define a program of this type session and go bracket n, this is actually a program that is yet to be executed. So we have defined a program, but it's not actually being run. To actually run it, we have to actually pass this to run session. And this run session, it only accept a session type n because like we, in general, there's a, the, we, we can only evaluate a, a session type program if, if uh, it is fully linked with other programs so that it, it, the only thing it does is just to terminate. But there's actually one, one additional uh, rules we can do which is that if the session type is to send a value and then terminate, then we can use this run session with result to run our program and then get back the result that T that is sent by the, this session, this session type program. So then receive value and send value, um, these are the, the ones that we have covered before. So for receive value, um, we, we just have the continuation that has the value. And the thing to note is that um, T has to actually have this uh, send and static trait. All these are built-in traits in Rust, which is to say that we cannot send a value containing reference, at least with the current version of Ferrite. And the value we send has to be thread safe. So, and send value is usually, uh, the same as we described just now. So I think there's no need for more introduction. And so with that, we let's go to the exercise session and we'll try to do uh, one or two exercise. And then, uh, and then the rest we will, so, so, I, so the idea now is that we will try to do some exercise. Hello. And I think we, we can do can the I first- Can I ask a thing. question? Yes. Hi. Um, so I have a, actual general oh, first yeah. thing for the presentation. It's very informative. Uh, I have a general question about the, your choice of using Rust to implement the session type language. Yes. The other Py calculus language that the projects I know, they all use uh, Lambda calculus language like Scala or Haskell. Mm -hmm. But uh, your choice is Rust. I'm just wondering, what's the pros and cons? Does it enable you to implement more complicated types or some other consideration? So the, I think the pros is that um, we can use, uh, so in a way the Rust itself is already more natural for using message passing concurrency as compared to other language. So, and it's more of a language culture. So in Rust, you can see uh, much more people using just Rust channels to spawn processes and pass around messages using just the Rust channels. So in a way, it's a more suited target for, to target these programmers to have them transition to use session types instead of normal Rust channels. And, the other, yeah. and the other advantage we have for Rust is that this, uh, the FIN types uh, nature in Rust, it actually allows us to define more define more efficient session type programs 
as compared to a non-affine language, a normal structural language like Haskell or Camel. Because um, when we write this uh, in continuation passing style here, um, even, though, even though we are using the library to enforce the linearity, but because this uh, continuation it contain a fine values, this means that this continuation it can only execute at most once. So which means that when Rust uh, see this program, it's actually, it should be able to optimize this and not have to worry about the, any of this value being copied, for example. So the value, the, the, the generated program, the end result compiled by the Rust compiler should be more efficient as well. Yeah, well, that's good to know. Um, one more question as um, when we were in, we were, when we were in a Robert class, we talked about the trilogy of the, of all the languages. I wonder, do you guys have any consideration of from category point of view for implementing the language? Um, not really. So I, I would say Rust is a more, more practical oriented language. So the original target for Rust is actually for, for system programming. So it's mainly, um, it was designed from a point of view, because Rust was uh, firstly developed by Mozilla. And one of their first use cases is to design the Firefox uh, browser rendering engine. So what they wanted is like a, a language for replacing C++ and C. So they, a lot of the design decision is actually focusing around that. And um, you, you can actually see that also from when you designing, uh, when you writing programs in Ferrite which is that um, with these affine values and with the, even with the closures and all the other constructs, um, they, they try to make it um, um, more, more efficient, I would say. So, so the programs, they tend to, they tend to compose more efficiently, I think. And hey. Yeah, I forgot what I want to say. Sorry. <laughs> maybe you maybe you'll think about it later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So um yeah, I'll I'll try to go with uh one and two exercise. And then maybe um the for the rest of the exercise, you can try to uh, implement it by yourself after the tutorial and the lectures. And when we have any questions on implementing the other tutorial. The other exercises, we can go come back again tomorrow to discuss about the solutions or where, where you get stuck. And of course, like if you if you get stuck, you also feel free to just un ask on Slack. So we can just uh, discuss that offline as well. And 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 after that in tomorrow, we, we can mostly focusing on writing um uh, implement um discussing about the, the challenges you have or anything that you cannot understand, you, you find it difficult to understand. And also, and also similarly, like the rest of the slides, they are also just used for um, describing each of the ferret constructs. So I think um, since you, you have already learned about the typing rules, um, most of these are just self-reference. So you can just uh, read about it. And, and, and when you write, when you try to implement the program, and also one thing I would want to say is that you can also refer to this uh, guidebook that I've written. So this on this FerriOS GitHub. So this is also linked in here. So this book, Ferri book. So here, uh, you, here it is also co contain mostly just the copy I have in the slides. So unfortunately I didn't write more, I didn't manage to write more documentation, but so here, it has all the descriptions of like the basic rules of how these constructs work, which you can also use to um, implement the challenges. So makes sense. And so, yeah, now that we, so we'll just use the remaining, I think 15 minutes and we'll start with this greeter exercise and we can find a volunteer to try and do this. So, any volunteer who would like to write this program? 
So I'll, I'll need a, a volunteer and the rest of you can be just uh, there to comment or try to help the person to complete the program. I'm watching chat or waiting for someone to take control in the editor. Yeah, I see there's a lot of people asking to join the session. So I, I believe there should be someone who is going to write this. Done. Anyone? Okay, I see up off me. Yep. So sure. All right, Joe's moving. Yep. So by the way, there's also this uh, approach that I say is a type-driven approach. So you to verify that whether you're writing some a program is uh, valid, you can just add a to-do inside a hole. So if you are familiar with Cog or Haskell, you, you might know there's a type hole. And in Rust, we can from the right just write this to-do, right? And we just save. So you just control save. And if you if there's any type error, you can see it in the editor here. So uh, hopefully your editor will also show these um, errors. So right now we can just ignore the warnings. And in this case, we can see like, uh, until this point, we haven't encountered any type errors. So that means the program we have written now until this point is valid. So we can just continue writing our program. We can just replace our to-do with the remaining expressions. So is, is everyone understand what this challenge is supposed to do? So, yeah, inside a closure, you also need a brace to looks good. So I guess we have finished the program and we'll just try to run. Looks like, oh no, looks like there's some synchronization issue. I think it's best that one of you, um, just one of you write this and the rest of you just uh, write in the comments or in the chat what should be written. Because it seems like the, there's a, there's some synchronization issues. Just feel free to ask in the chat. No, I mean, just feel free to talk out. Um, this tutorial is supposed to be interactive. So no need to be quiet. Are we having some issues? Correctly out of sync. Okay. I guess we can try and run this. So here I also have a terminal. You can also try and run this in zero one three. So if you run this, so you can see, okay, now we have the hello at least. So that means we have now successfully completed our first exercise. Great. 
Now let's go to the next one. So we have this adder program. And what we need is to implement an adder client. So we have an adder client and we have a main session. Oops. So can someone Is anyone writing implementing it? So it's a Okay, in the meanwhile, I can probably answer. There's a question I saw on Slack by Prasang, so I can answer it while the rest of you try to implement the, the exercise. So you say you don't understand, I would say, the ability for Rust to spawn threads. So um, Rust, the, the native Rust allows us to spawn threads, and, and so the usual way we, uh, or at least in the be beginning, like um, in the beginning of Rust, the usual way to have concurrency is just to spawn an OS thread directly. So, but as you might know, if you have a lot of process, as this is especially true for a session type. So let's say you have a session type program that has like, let's say a thousand process, and if you spawn, one OS thread for each of them, then this will be um, this will not be very efficient and it will um, slow down your program because um, the OS threads um, they are additional costs for the OS scheduler to to maintain to to run the threads to schedule the threads. So in the async class, what we have is this uh. What we have is this uh, construct called TAS, in the which is kind of like lightweight threading, and so it's a user space scheduler. Uh, it's, it's a user space task. So it, or you can think of it like a user space thread that is uh, multiplex on the actual OS thread. So when you use a library like Tokyo, and let's say you spawn a, a thousand tasks. In actual behind the scene, the library it will try to execute this task in a small number of threads. So, for example, Tokyo may, may just spawn thirty threads, and the all the tasks, all the the thousand tasks, they will be queued in this thread, and there will be some user space scheduler to um, schedule and execute the threads. So. I see that we should receive the error via channel. Yes. So we need to receive a channel first before we do something. So we also have seems to have people stuck on the main session. Yeah. So the main session, you are not supposed to um, write any, you, you are not supposed to implement the actual program in the main session. So you should just uh, link the adder provider and the adder client together. So that, that, that should be done in, that, that's what should be done in the main session. And you can either use include session, you can either use include session or you can use the apply channel to, to, to link the two. So here, here's the tips. 
easy way is actually to use a uh, apply chain. Yes. So, um, sorry, so what, what, um, extension are you using uh your 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 visual studio code has more annotations than mine does for things like this rust analyzer rust, rust analyzer. analyzer yeah so if you go to the extension so you just search for rust analyzer and this will so this is the one So since we have a limited time, maybe I'll just try and complete the add the client for you so that we can wrap up the session. Yes, receive channel adder. Yep, that's right. Send value to adder. And then what value do we want to send? So we just want to send one plus two. So we, we want to send, so there's some macro, so there's some macro construct in, in fair, right? But I didn't cover it. So, so, so you, so maybe you should just use the normal function constructs. So remember that um, in the client, so, so the name of the session type is uh, from the perspective of the provider. So if the session type is received value, from the client perspective, it should be sending value to you. Yeah, so you send a value. So the first value is one. And then you want to send a value again. Uh, we can remove the, yeah, so two. So after we send the value, we want to receive value because the provider is sending something. So we want to receive from it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, looks good. Yes, looks like we have uh, we have someone completed most almost completed the solution. So I guess we can try and run it. Yes, I think it's been done. So cargo bin run zero to add. No. Did we get out of sync? Because I don't see any error here. Main session. Oh, yes, there's a comma here. You know, so in, in Rust, if you want to return something at the end, there should be no comma. And add a provider, platform, as expected. So 
So I think there's some errors, but for some reason the neither side is waiting on termination right now, right? Yeah. So in any case, I think we 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 can probably continue this uh, session offline. We can continue our discussion on Slack, and also we will just um we I will just leave this uh, interactive session open so that if you if you want to try out the solution, you can just uh continue working on this uh interactive uh session. Since we there there will be like a uh, ten minutes break before the next lecture. Uh, so yeah, um, but thanks for come, uh, attending the tutorial. I, I hope this kind of uh, interactive session would help. Um, and so yeah, see, see you tomorrow. I think and... Green just got it. Sorry? I think Green just got the uh, fix ah. if you want to try it again. Oh, okay. Yeah, right now it's a bit weird because there should be some tech errors upside but oh i think i know why so so here we are defining functions so we are actually defining functions that return the session so here we actually need to call the functions right so so we need actually need to call the functions before we i think i see an extra semicolon in adder client as well oh yeah here so yeah we, we should remove this semicolon and then we just run result response. Oh yeah, and and also this also one thing that is made this common error in Rust, which is that it's recommended that if you are not familiar, you should always use the move closure. And what this basically says is that you are moving the ownership to into the closure. So um, this is something that uh, is just uh, specific to Rust. And for the purpose of tutorial, if you encounter things like these borrow errors, you just add a move in front of the closure and it should mostly get rid of the errors. And yeah, great. We, we, we have fixed, we have solved the second exercise. So yeah. Um, do you have any feedback or any further question? Chat's been pretty quiet, focused on the code. Yeah. Okay, if, if not, I think uh, if any of you need to go for a break before the next lecture, just feel free to go. I think from now on, we'll just be just chatting. Uh, so, so maybe let me briefly hear in uh, say a few words. Uh, everyone needs okay. a break, so I will be brief. But I really would like to thank Soares for doing this. Um, it's amazing to have uh, this session type library in in Rust. Uh, I really encourage you to explore it. I mean, Soares achieved real wonders. Uh, this has been a side project for him for about two years worth of development, right? As a side project, but yeah. it's really very, very impressive. And thanks a lot, Soares, for doing this. I really appreciate. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, yeah, so so yeah, the project is still in quite heavy development. So um, I'll, I'll be glad to see if we have any real first users out of this tutorial. A lot of fun, thanks. Yeah. It's great to see that you are having fun with this session. I think other than the brief out of sync problem that is happening just now, it seems to be going smooth.
Okay, I'll, I'll briefly step away, then I'll, I'll be back. Yeah. So is there any other feedback? If anyone is still here, is there any feedback you'd like to talk about this uh, Visual Studio sharing session? One idea, if no one else has anything, is that um, it seems to be fussier when people are sharing lines. So when everyone's collaborating on the same line trying to do stuff, I think you have higher odds of things going wacky. Um, one thing that might make it easier if there's somewhere where there's going to be a lot of contention is having like maybe a template that has the basic flow in there where you just have like receive, send with no bodies filled in and then let people split up. It might make things a little smoother. Mm. Yeah, I think I don't know how much you end up giving away if you uh, fill in part of the exercise like that, but it's an idea. Yeah. I think it would be most of the work. Since, you may be right. Since the the problem I had was translating in my mind between the client side and the provider side. Yeah, it's fair. Uh, types. Yeah, that, that 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 can be a challenge in the beginning. Or maybe I don't know if there's if there's some other way to kind of get people to fan out a little bit. Yeah, I don't know what you could do. I think I well, well we had separate client provider and main, so it was yeah. an opportunity for free people. Yeah, I think maybe we I, could try and assign roles or get people to call them out and just right. claim sections of code or something. That's right. I, I think it's better to have one specific person doing the typing. And if anyone else want to collaborate on that, um, they will just uh, talk through the through, through the Zoom. So so they should just talk and sure. tell that person what to write. Um, maybe I will just uh, arrange this on Slack. So I, I will just assign us get someone assigned for each of the exercise so that they, they will do it tomorrow. Yeah. Seems reasonable. And by the way, since the next session is starting soon, I will just stop sharing the screen, but uh, the, the, the live session will still be going on. So if you want to continue the other exercise or do other things, feel free to do it.